Second and third, but I imagine even the, the fourth one, which is a different period you weren't alive then, you have no connection to. Presumably, you were in all of those. Um, yes, I, I assume that there is a part of me in all of the books, my passion for history, my interest. However, the main characters, I write characters that I, I dream of, of being like. Lina Vilkis in Between Chains of Grey is brave and, and, you know, and, and compassionate and caring. And I'm not saying that I'm not those things, but I admire them so much. Um, you know, and then other characters. In Salt to the Sea, there's a character named Florian. And that character was born in Germany at a school visit when a boy came up to me with a book to sign and he had a post-it note and it said Florian. And I said, oh, is that your name? And he said, yeah, so. I said, oh, it, it's a cool name. And he said, if it's so cool, put me in your book. <laughs> and it was like I regressed to high school. And I looked at him, I said, fine, I will. <laughs> Florian was not a name used during World War II. So then I had to find a way to justify and, and put this kid in a book. The shoe poet in Salt to the Sea, this, this elderly man who divides life through shoes he was born on a street in Italy um, with my Italian publisher, Garzanti. A pair of shoes, they were in the window, a small little tiny stamp of a window. And I said, what is this? And she said, oh, Ruta, it's the most famous shoemaker in all of Italy. His shoes, they're pure poetry. And I thought, oh, pure poetry, a poet of shoes, the shoe poets. So they come in different ways, yeah. So uh, are you a... Uh... So you're a magpie of sorts. You're one of those people who notices things. And do you do you have a note? Do you jot things down? Or you go, oh, shoot poet, I will have that, and you scribble things down. Abs absolutely. Every hotel I'm in has a piece of hotel stationery in the room, right? You have this either notepad next to the phone or a piece of hotel stationery. As soon as I get in, I mark the date and the room number that I'm in, and then. As everything is happening, I am sketching down details. And something so small as a hole in a particular part of a sweater that I found interesting. How did that hole get in that part of this person's sweater? Small detail. The, the second book, Out of the Easy, can you say something about how that was, how that was a different experience from the first book you presumably don't completely know what you're doing. Um, the second book, you are expected to know what you're doing. You presumably know that there are going to be publishers interested, you know that there are going to be readers interested. How does that change the process of setting out on, on writing a book? That was probably more my experience with my first and third book, because I, I wrote Between Shades of Grey, and it took a long time to sell. Nearly a year before Philomel Books, which is a small imprint of Penguin Young Readers in the United States, decided to publish it. Well, I was certain, okay, my book's about totalitarianism for kids. Like, that's clearly not going to be a career. New York Times bestseller. Exactly. In waiting. Exactly. So instead, I, I changed gears, and I wrote my mother's story. And I thought, oh, I'm going to write a book about feminism in historical context in the U.S. And I wrote Out of the Easy, so I already had Out of the Easy. And Philomel was just kind enough that, um, and they only bought one book from me, Between Shades of Grey, but then they decided that they wanted to publish Out of the Easy. So it was already sort of written. It was really salt to the sea that the da -da -da -da, the, the pressure of... Some kind of expectation. Though. Definitely, yeah, definitely. That was the, the third book. And I did feel pressure, but I also felt excitement because I had the benefit of having toured um, and having toured for some of the wonderful foreign publishers um, and knowing that there were readers out there that no matter how um, remote and odd this hidden piece of history was, they were anxious to learn about it. And so I was excited and motiv motivated, and of course, scared and fear. Yeah, I mean, of course. Have you stopped being scared or fearful? Is that, is that going to be there forever? No, I hope it's there forever, because that's one thing I learned working in the music business. When you are scared, that means you're growing. You are out of your comfort zone. There's something there that's that's frightening you. And if we're if we're not frightened, you know, then we're coasting. But it's in our moments of white knuckle, you know, where we're losing sleep. There's an opportunity for growth. 
So yes, that sounds like, oh yes, I'm no get scared. Yeah, I, I do, and I complain about it, and I do lose sleep. But I also know it's part of the process. If I have writer's block, it's because I'm scared. Either I'm scared it's not good enough, I'm scared my publisher isn't gonna like it, I'm scared that I haven't done enough research for the book to be authentic, and I might not be representing these human beings that have entrusted me with their story. So yeah, fear is a big part of it. Excellent, this is a terrible warning for anyone who wants to write here. We apologize to anyone who thought this was a good idea. It's a terrible it's idea. Terrifying.